A Knife in the Dark. Thank you for the photo. As they prepared for sleep in the inn at Free, darkness lay on Buckland, a mist strayed in the dells and along the river bank. The house at Crick Hollow stood silent. Fatty Bulger opened the door cautiously and peered out. A feeling of fear had been growing on him all day, and he was unable to rest or go to bed. There was a brooding threat in the breathless night air. As he stared out into the gloom, a black shadow moved under the trees. The gate seemed to open of its own accord and close again, without a sound. Terror seized him. He shrank back, and for a moment he stood trem trembling in the hall, and he shut and locked the door. Apparently, but not usually. This is emo music. Thank you for the lights. Look behind you, I have a wall behind me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't know. I haven't. I started doing makeup. What? Well, when I started streaming on Twitch, so it's like six, seven months ago. <laughs> so I'm still figuring it out. But thanks. The night deepened. There came a soft sound of horses led with the strength with stealth along the lane. Outside the gate they stopped, and three black figures entered like shades of night creeping across the ground. One went to the door, one went to the corner of the house on either side, and there they stood, as still as the shadows of stones, while night went slowly on. The house and the quiet trees seemed to be waiting breathlessly. There was a faint stir in the leaves, and a cock crowed far away. The cold hour before dawn was passing. The figure by the door moved. In the dark, without moon or stars, a drawn blade gleamed as if a chill light had been unsheathed. There was a blow, soft but heavy, and the door shuddered. Open, in the name of Mordor, said a voice thin and menacing. At a second blow, the door yielded and fell back with timbers burst and lock broken. Black figures passed swiftly in. At that moment, among the trees nearby, a torn, a horn rang out. It rent the night like fire on a hilltop. Awake! Fear! Fire! Foes! Awake! Fatty Bulger had not been idle. As soon as he saw the dark shapes creep from the garden, he knew that he must run for it or perish. And run he did, out of the back door, through the garden, and over the fields. When he reached the nearest house, more than a mile away, he coll collapsed on the doorstep. No, 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 he was crying. No, not me. I haven't got it. It was some time before anyone could make out what he was babbling about. At last they got the idea that the enemy that enemies were in Buckland, some strain inva strange invasion from the old forest, and then they lost no more time. Fear, fire, foes. The brandy bucks were blowing the horn call of Buckland that had not been sounded for a hundred years, not since the, since the white wolves came in the fell winter, when the brandy wine was frozen over. Awake, awake. Far away, answering horns were heard. The alarm was spreading. The black figures fled from the house. One of them let fall a hobbit cloak on the step as he ran. In the lane, the noise of hooves broke out, and gathering into a gallop went hammering away into the darkness. All about Crick Hollow, there was the sound of horns blowing and voices crying and feet running, but the black riders rode like a gale to the north gate. Let the little people blow. Sauron would deal with them later. Meanwhile, they had other another errand. They knew now that the house was empty, and the ring had gone. They rode down the guards at the gate, and vanished from the Shire. We get a lot of bread and process ye. Oh, ye, of course. I do enjoy reading. Sometimes 
I don't know. Sometimes I have to convince myself to read, but once I am reading, it's like I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for being here. I hope you're having a good night. In the early night, Frodo woke from deep sleep suddenly, as if some sound or presence had disturbed him. He saw that Strider was sitting alert in his chair. His eyes gleamed like in the light of the fire, which had been tended and was burning brightly, but he made no, but he made no sign or movement. Frodo soon went to sleep again, but his dreams were again troubled with the noise of the wind and of galloping hooves. The wind seemed to be curling around the house and shaking it, and far off he heard a, a horn blowing wildly. He opened his eyes and heard a cock crowing lustily in the inn-yard. Strider had drawn the curtains and pushed back the shutters with a clang. The first grey light of day was in the room, and a cold air was coming through the open window. As soon as Strider had aroused them all, he led the way to their bedrooms. When they saw them, they were glad that they had taken his advice. The windows had been forced open and were swinging, and the curtains were flapping. The beds were tossed about, and the bolsters slashed and slung upon the floor. The brown mat was torn to pieces. Strider immediately went to fetch the landlord. Poor Mr. Butterbird looked sleepy and frightened. He had already hardly closed his eyes all night, so he said, but he had never heard a sound. Never has such a thing happened in my time, he cried, raising his hands in horror. Guests unable to sleep in their beds and good bolsters ruined and all. What are we coming to? Dark times, said Strider, but for the present you may be left in peace. When you have got rid of us, we will leave at once, never mind about breakfast. A drink and a bite standing will have to do. We shall be packed in a few minutes. Mr. Butterbur hurried off to see that their ponies were got ready and to fetch them a bite. But every but very soon he came back in dismay. The ponies had vanished. The stable doors had all been opened in the night and they were gone. But only Mary's ponies, every single other horse and beast not only Mary's ponies, but every single other horse and beast in the place. Frodo was crushed by the news. How could they hope to reach Rivendell on foot, pursued by mounted enemies? They might as well set out for the moon. Strider sat silent for a while, looking at the hobbits, as if he was weighing up their strength and courage. Ponies would not help us to escape horsemen. He said at last thoughtfully, as if he guessed what Frodo had in mind. We should not go much slower on foot, not on the roads that I mean to take. I was going to walk in any case. It is the food and the stores that trouble me. We cannot count on getting anything to eat between here and Rivendell except what we take with us, and we ought to take plenty to spare, for we may be delayed or forced to go round about far out of the direct way. How much are you prepared to carry on your backs? As much as we must, said Pippin with a sinking heart, but trying to show that he was tougher than he looked, or felt. I can carry enough for two, said Sam defiantly. Can't anything be done, Mr. Butterbur? asked Frodo. Can't we get a couple of ponies in the village, or even one just for the baggage? I don't suppose we could hire them, but we might be able to buy them, he added, doubtfully wondering if he could afford it. I doubt it, said the landlord unhappily. The two or three riding ponies that were here in Bree were stabled in my yard, and they are gone. As for other animals, horses or ponies for draught or what not, there are very few of them in Bree, so they won't be for sale. But I'll do what I can. I'll route out Bob and send him around as soon as may be. Yes, said Strider reluctantly. You had better do that. I am afraid we shall have to try to get at least one pony, but so ends all hope of starting early and slipping away quietly. We might as well have blown a horn to announce our departure. That was part of their plan, no doubt. 
Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the welcome. Hello. My phone is gonna run out of battery. Not very soon, but I'm still gonna. There is one crumb of comfort, said Mary, and more than a crumb, I hope, we can have breakfast while we wait and sit down to it. Let's get hold of Nob. In the end, there was more than three hours delay. Bob came back with the report that no horse or pony was to be got for love or money in the neighborhood, except one. Bill Fernie had one that he might possibly sell. A poor, half-starved creature it is, said Bob, but he won't part with it for less than thrice, thrice it's worth, seeing how you're placed. Not if I knows Bill Fernie. Bill Fernie, said Frodo, isn't there some trick? Wouldn't the beast bolt back to him with all of our stuff? Or help in tracking us or something? I wonder, said Strider. But I cannot imagine any run animal running home to him once it got away. I fancy this is only an afterthought of the kind of kind Master Fernie's just a way of increasing his profits from the affair. The chief danger is that the poor beast is probably at death's door, but there does not seem to be any choice. What does he want for it? Bill Fernie's price was twelve silver pennies, and that was indeed at least three times the pony's value in those parts. It proved to be a bony, underfed, and dispirited animal, but it did not look like dying just yet. Mr. Butterbur paid for it himself, and offered Mary another eighteen pence as some compens compensation for the lost animals. He was an honest man, and well off as things were reckoned in Bree, but thirty silver pennies was a sore blow to him, and being cheated by Bill Fernie made it harder to bear. As a matter of fact, he came out on the right side in the end. It turned out later that only one horse had been actually stolen, the others had been driven off or had bolted in terror, and they were found wandering in different corners of Breland. Mary's ponies had escaped altogether, and eventually, having a good deal of sense, they made their way to the downs in search of Fatty Lumpkin. So they came under the care of Tom Bombadil for a while and were well off. But when news of the events at Bree came to Tom's ears, he sent them to Mr. Butterbur, who thus got five good beasts at a very fair price. They had to work harder in Bree, but Bob treated them well, so on the whole they were lucky. They missed a dark and dangerous journey, but they never came to Rivendell. Oh, thank you. However, in the meantime, for all Mr. Butterbur knew, his money was gone for good or for bad, and he had other troubles, for there was a great commotion as soon as the remaining guests were astir and heard news of the raid on the inn. The southern travellers had lost several horses and blamed the innkeeper loudly, until it became known that one of their own number had also disappeared in the night, none other than Bill Fernie's squint-eyed companion. Suspicion fell on him. At once. If you pick up with a horse feet the horse thief and bring him to my house, said Mr. Butterbur angrily, you ought to pay for all the damage yourselves and not come shouting at me. Go and ask for any whether where your handsome friend is. But it appeared that he was nobody's friend, and nobody could recollect when he had joined their party. Hello. After their breakfasts, the hobbits had to repack and get together further supplies for the longer journey they were now expecting. It was close on ten o'clock before they at last got off, but that by that time the whole of Bree was buzzing with excitement. Frodo's vanishing trick, the, re the appearance of the black horsemen, the robbing of the stables, and not least the news that Strider the ranger had joined the mysterious hobbits, 
made such a tale as would last for many uneventful years. Most of the inhabitants of Bree and Staddle, most of the, most of the inhabitants of Bree and Staddle, and many even from Combe and Archet, were crowded in the road to see this traveler start. The other guests at the inn were at the doors or hanging out the windows. Uh, emo for the day, I should guess. <laughs> Oh, but we do it more often. Strider had changed his mind and he decided to leave Bree by the main road. Any attempt to cast to set off across country at once would make matters worse. Half the inhabitants would follow them and see what they were up to and to prevent them from trespassing. <laughs> Thank you. They said farewell to Nob and Bob, and took leave of Mr. Butterbur with many thanks. I hope we shall meet again some day when things are merry once more, said Frodo. I should like nothing better than to stay in your house in peace for a, for a while. He tramped off anxious and downhearted under the eyes of the crowd. Not all the faces were friendly, nor all the words that were shouted. Thank you. <laughs> well, turn two pages. But Strider seemed to be held in awe by most of the Brelanders, and those that he stared at shut their mouths and drew away. He walked in front with Frodo, next came Merry and Pippin, and last came Sam leading the pony, which was laden with as much of their baggage as they had the heart to give it. But already it looked less dejected, as if it approved of its change, of the change in its fortunes. Sam was chewing an apple thoughtfully. He had a pocket full of them, a parting present from Nob and Bob. Apples for walking and a pipe for sitting, he said, but I'll reckon I'll miss them both before long. The hobbits took no notice of the inquisitive heads that peeped out of doors or popped over walls and fences as they passed. Why am I on it? Alrighty. Um. But they drew nearer to the further gate, Frodo. But as they drew near nearer to the further gate, Frodo saw a dark, ill-kept house behind a thick hedge, the last house in the village, in one of the windows he caught a glimpse of a sh of a sallow fl face with sly, slanting eyes, but it vanished at once. So that's where that southerner is hiding, he thought. He looks more than half like a goblin. Over the hedge another man was staring boldly. He had heavy black brows and, a dark, and dark scornful eyes. His large mouth curled. In a sneer, he was smoking a short black pipe. As they approached, he took it out of his mouth and spat. Morning, Longshanks, he said. Off early? Found some friends at last? Strider nodded, but did not answer. Morning, my little friends, he said to the others. I suppose you know who you've taken up with. That's... Think it not Strider, that is, though I've heard other names not so pretty. Watch out tonight, and you, Sam, may, Sammy, don't go ill-treating my poor pony. Ta! He spat again. Sam turned quickly. And you, Fernie, he said, put your ugly face out of sight, or you'll get, or it will get hurt. With a sudden flick, quick as lightning, an apple left his hand and hit Bill square on the nose. He ducked too late, and curses came from behind the edge. Hedge. Waste of a good apple, said Sam regretfully, and strode on. At last they left the village behind. The escort of children and strang stragglers that had followed them, followed them got tired and turned back at the south gate. 
Passing through, they kept on along the road for some miles. It went to the left, curving back into its eastward line as it rounded the feet of Bree Hill. Then it began to run swiftly downwards into a wooded country. To their left, they could see some of the houses and hobbit holes of the, sh of the saddle on the gentler southern slopes of the hill. Down in a deep hollow away north of the road, they were there were wisps of rising smoke that showed where the comb lay. Where comb lay, our shit was hidden in the trees beyond. After the road had run down some way and had left Bree Hill standing tall and brown behind, they came on a narrow track that led off towards the north. This is where we leave the open and take to cover, said Strider. Not a shortcut, I hope, said Pippin. Our last shortcut through the woods nearly ended in disaster. Ah, but you had not got me with you then, laughed Strider. My cuts short or long don't go wrong. He took a look up and down the road. No one was in sight, and he led the way quickly down towards the wooded valley. His plan, as far as they could understand it without knowing the country, was to go towards Archit at first, but straight as he could over the wild lands to Weathertop Hill. In that way they would, if all went well, cut, a, t cut off a great loop of the road, which was further on bent southwards to avoid the Midgewater Marshes. But of course, they would have to pass through the marshes themselves, and Strider's description of them was not encouraging. Thank you for the follow. However, in the meantime, walking was not unpleasant. Indeed, if it had not been for the disturbing events of the night before, they would have enjoyed this part of the journey better than any up to that time. The sun was shining clear, but not too hot. The woods in the valley were still leafy and full of color, and seemed peaceful and wholesome. Strider guided them confidently among many crossing paths, Although left to themselves, they would have soon been at a loss. He was taking a wandering course with many turns and doublings to put off any pursuit. Bill Fernie would have watched where we left the road for certain, he said. Though I don't think he will follow us himself. He knows the land round here well enough, but he knows that he is no match for me in a wood. It is where he may tell others. It is what he may tell others, others that I'm afraid of. I don't suppose they are far away. I think we have, we, if they think we have made for Archit, so much the better. Ha. Huh. Thank you for gift. Ah, uh, yes, Hannah. And welcome. Whether because of Strider's skill or some other reason, they saw no sign and heard no sound of any other living thing all day, neither two-footed, except birds, throws off my sneeze when I have to mute it. <laughs> Neither two-footed except birds, nor four-footed except for one fox and a few squirrels. The next day they began to steer a steady course eastwards, and still all was quiet and peaceful. On the third day out from Bree, they came out of the Chetwood. The land had been falling steadily ever since they, they turned aside from the road, and now they entered a wide, flat expanse of country, more difficult to manage. They were far beyond the borders of Breland, out on, in the pathless wilderness, and drawing near to the Midgewater Marshes. The ground now became damp and in places boggy, and here and there...
and here and there they came upon pools and wide stretches of reeds and rushes filled with the warbling of the hidden little hidden birds. They had to pick their way carefully to keep both dry-footed and on their proper course. At first they made fair progress, but as they went on their passage became slower and more dangerous. The marshes were bewildering and treacherous, and there was no permanent trail even for rangers to find through their shifting quagmires. <laughs> the flies began to torment them, and the air was full of clouds of tiny midges that crept up their sleeves and breeches and into their hair. <laughs> I am being eaten alive, cried Pippin. Midge water. There's more midges than water. What do they live on when they can't get Hobbit? Asked Sam, scratching his neck. It is one of my favorite lines. <laughs> they spent a miserable day in this lonely and unpleasant country. Their camping place was damp, cold, and uncomfortable, and the biting insects would not let them sleep. There was also abominable creatures hunting, the re hunting in the reeds and tussocks that from the sound of them were evil relatives of the cricket. There were thousands of them, and they squeaked all around. Neek freak, neek freak, unceasingly all the night, until the hobbits were nearly frantic. The next day, the fourth, was a little better, and at night, almost as comfortless. Though the Neeker Breakers, as Sam called them, had been left behind, the midges still pursued them. As Frodo lay, tired but miserable, tired but unable to close his eyes, he see it seemed to him that far away there came a light in the eastern sky. It flashed and faded many times. It was not the dawn, for that was still some time off. What is that light? He said to Strider, who had risen and was standing gazing ahead into the night. I do not know. Strider answered, It is too distant to make out. It is like lightning that leaps up from the hilltops. Frodo lay down again, but for a long while he could still see the white flashes, and against them the dark, tall figure of Strider, standing silent and watchful. At last he passed into an uneasy sleep. I don't think I thanked you for the crown, so thank you. They had not gotten far on the fifth day, when they left the last straggling pools and reed beds of the marshes behind them. The land before them began steadily to rise again, away in the distance eastward they could now see a line of hills. The highest of them was at the right of the line, and a little separated from the others. It had a conical top slightly flattened at the summit. That is Weathertop, said Strider. The old road which we have left far away on our right runs to the south of it and passes not far from its foot. We might reach it by noon tomorrow if we go straight towards it. I suppose we had better do so. What do you mean? asked Frodo. I mean, when we do get there, it is not certain what we shall find, but it is close to the road. But surely we're hoping to find Gandalf there? Yes, but the hope is faint. If he comes this way at all, he may not pass through Bree, and so he may not know what we are doing. And anyway, unless by luck we, are, we arrive almost together, we shall miss one, uh, one another and it will not be safe for him or us to wait there long. 
If the riders fail to find us in the wilderness, they are likely to make for the weather top themselves. It commands a wide view all round. Indeed, there are many birds and beasts in this country that could see us, as we stand here, from that hilltop. Not all the birds are to be trusted, and there are other sp spies more evil than they are. Thank you, and welcome. The hobbits looked anxiously at the distant hills. Sam looked up into the pale sky, fearing to see hawks or eagles hovering over them with bright, unfriendly eyes. You do make me feel uncomfortable and lonesome, Strider, he said. What do you advise us to do? asked Frodo. I think, answered Strider slowly, as if he was not quite sure. I think the best thing to do is to go straight eastward, eastward from here as we can, to make for that line of hills, not for the Weathertop. Then we can strike a path I know that runs at their feet, and it will bring us to Weathertop from the north and less openly, and we shall see what we shall see. All that day they plodded along until the cold and early evening came down. The land became drier and more barren, but mists and vapors lay behind them on the marshes. A few melancholy birds were piping and wailing till the round red sun sank slowly into the western shadows, and an empty silence fell. The hobbits thought of the soft light of sunset dancing through the cheerful windows of Bag End, far away. At the day's end, they came to a stream that wandered down from the hills to lose itself in the stagnant marshland, and they went up along its banks while the light lasted. It was already night when they had halted and when they halted and made their camp under some stunted alders by the shores of the stream. Ahead there loomed now against the dusty sky a bleak and treeless bleak and treeless backs of hills. That night they set a watch and Strider, it seemed, did not sleep at all. The moon was waxing, and the early night hours a cold grey light. And in the early hours a cold grey light lay on the light. The next morning they set out again soon after sunrise. There was a frost there was a frost in the air and the sky was a pale clear blue. The hobbits felt refreshed as if they had a night of unbroken unbroken sleep. Already they were getting used to much walking on short commons, shorter at any rate than what is in the shire that they would have thought barely enough to keep them on their legs. Pippin declared that Frodo was looking twice the hobbit that he had been. Very odd, said Frodo, tightening his belt, considering that there is actually a good deal less of me. I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely, or sh I shall become a wraith. Do not speak of such things, said Strider quickly and with surprising earnestness. Correct. Thank you for this. Bye, I asked. Oh, okay. There is a redeem for these. <laughs> the hills grew nearer. They made an undulating ridge, often rising almost to a thousand feet, and here and there falling again to low clefts or passes leading into the eastern land beyond. Along the crest on this ridge, the hobbits could see what looked like looked to be the remains of a gr of green-grown hills and dikes, and in the clefts there stood, still stood the ruins of old works of stone. By night they had reached the foot of the weathered slopes, and there they camped. It was the night of the 5th of October, and they were six days out from Bree.
In the morning we found, for the first time since they had left the Chatwood, a plain track to see. They turned right and followed it southwards. It ran cunningly, taking a line that seemed to be chosen so as to keep as much hidden as possible from the view, both of the hilltops above and the flats to the west. It dived into dells and hugged steep banks where it passed over flatter and more open ground on either side of it. There were lines of large boulders and hewn stones that screened the travelers almost like a hedge. Teeths. I wonder who made this path and what for, said Mary as they walked along one of these avenues where the stones were unusually large and closely set. Closely set. Closely set. I am not sure that I like it. It has, well, rather a barrow whitish look. Is there any barrow on Weathertop? No, there is no barrow on Weathertop, nor on any of these hills, answered Schreider. The men of the West did not live here, though their latter in their latter days they defended the hills for a while against the evil that came out of the came out of Angmar. This path was made to serve the forts along the walls, but before long, in the first days of the North Kingdom, they built a great watchtower on Weathertop. Asmon Sail, Sul, they called it. It was burned and broken, and nothing remains of it now but a tumbled rain. Like a rough crown on the old hill's head. Yet once it was tall, and it is told that Elrond stood there watching for the open for the coming of Gilgalad out of the west in the days of the last alliance. The hobbits gazed at Strider. It seemed that he was learned in old lore, as well in the, as well as in the ways of the wild. Who is Gilgalad? asked Mary, but Strider did not answer and he seemed to be lost in thought. Suddenly, a low voice murmured. Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. His sword was long, his lance was keen, his shining helm afar was seen, that countless stars in heaven, heaven's field were mirrored in his sh silver shield. But long ago he rode away, and that's where he dwelleth none, and where he dwelleth none can say, for into darkness fell his star in Mordor, where the shadows are. I am falling asleep. <gasps> the others turned in amazement, for the voice was Sam's. Don't stop, said Mary. That's all I know, muttered Sam, blushing. I, I learned it from Mr. Bilbo when I was a lad. He used to tell me tales like that, knowing how I was always one for hearing about elves. It was Mr. Bilbo who has taught me my letters. He was a, he was mighty book learned and was dear old Mr. Bilbo, and he wrote poetry. He wrote what I have just said. He did not make that up, said Strider. It is part of the lay that is called the Fall of Gilgalad which is an ancient tongue. Bobo must have translated it, but I never knew that. <sighs> there was a lot more, said Sam, all about Mordor. I didn't learn that part, but it gave me some... It, it, 
It gave me the shivers. I never thought I should be going that way myself. Going to Mordor? cried Pippin. I hope it won't, won't come to that. Do not speak his name so loudly, said Strider. Get some sleep, yeah, I should. It was already midday when they drew near the southern end of the path and saw before them in a place clear in the pale clear light of the autumn so October sun a gray green bank leading up like a bridge on the northern slide, side of the hill they decided to make for the top at once while the daylight while the daylight was broad concealment was no longer possible and they could only hope that no enemy was, was enemy or spy was observing them Nothing was to be seen moving on the hill. If Gandalf was anywhere about, there was no sign of him. I don't have that much more. Oh, actually, it is kind of more. Also, no stopping spot. Stopping spot in two pages. She will probably take that one. Okay. Poems and verses of great elves passed from lines to first to last versus fair or sweet. I didn't read that well, but. Yeah. On the western flank of Heather Weathertop, they found a sheltered hollow at the bottom of which there was a bowl-shaped dell with grassy sides. There they left Sam and Pippin with the pony and their packs and luggage. The other three went on. After half an hour's plodding climb, Strider reached the crown of the hill. Frodo and Mary followed, tired and breathless. The last hope had been steep. And rocky. Last slope. I knew it read it wrong, went and reread it, and still didn't read it right. On the top they found, as Strider had said, a wide ring of ancient stonework, now crumbling or covered with with aging grass grass, but in the center a cairn of bones, cairn of broken stones had been placed, but they were blackened as if with fire about them. The turf was burned into the roots and all within the ring. The turf was brushed and the roots all within the ring. Why can't I read? About them the road was... About them the turf was burned to the roots and all within the ring of grass that was scorched and shriveled. All within that? As if flames had, had swept the hilltop just to be replaced. Just to be replaced where I get that. My goodness. Okay. Thank you for Rose. About then the turf was burned into the roots, and all within the ring the grass was scorched and shriveled, as if flames had swept the hilltop, but there was no sign of any living thing. Standing upon the rim of the ruined circle, they saw all around 
All round below them a wide prospect, for the most parts, most part of lands empty and featureless except for patches of woodland way to the south, beyond which they caught here and there the glint of distant water. Beneath them, on this southern side, there ran like a ribbon the old road coming out of the west and winding up and down, until it faded behind a ridge of dark land to the east. Nothing was moving on it. Forwarding, following its line eastward with their eyes, they saw the mountains. The nearer foothills were brown and somber. Behind them stood taller shapes of grey, and behind those again were the high peaks glimmering, were high, were high white peaks glimmering among the clouds. I do know how to read, and so do you, you type the thing. Well, here we are, said Mary, and fairly, very cheerless and uninviting it looks. There was no water, no shelter, and no sign of Gandalf. I don't blame him for not waiting if he ever came here. I wonder said Strider, looking around thoughtfully. Even if he was a day or two behind us at Bree, he could have arrived here first. He can ride very swiftly when need presses. Suddenly he stooped and looked at the stone on the top of the cairn. It was flatter than the others and whiter, as if it had escaped the fire. He picked up and examined it, turning it in his fingers. This has been handled recently, he said. What do you think of these marks? On the flat underside, Frodo saw some scratches. There seems to be a stroke, a dot, and three more strokes, he said. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to see this. It's not going to focus. This will focus. It's just a line, two line, two little lines, a dot, and then three lines. I'm glad you find my voice in. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. The stroke on the left might be a G, G rune with a thin, with thin branches, said Strider. It might be a sign left by Gandalf, though one cannot be sure. The scratches are fine, and they certainly look fresh, but the marks might mean something quite different, and have nothing to do with us. Rangers use runes, and they come here sometimes. What could they mean if Gandalf, even if Gandalf made them? asked Mary. I should say answered Strider, that they stood for G3 and were a sign that Gandalf was here on October the 3rd. That is three days ago now. It would also show that he was in a hurry and danger was at hand, and that he had no time, nor he, or he did not dare to write anything longer or plainer. If that is so, we, may, we must be wary. <laughs> I don't know, that's up to you. It's a druid symbol. I wish we could feel sure that he made the marks, whatever they may mean, said Frodo. It would be a great comfort to know that he was on the way in front of us or behind us. Perhaps, said Strider. For myself, I believe that he was here and was in danger. There, is, there have been scorching flames here, and now the light that we saw three nights ago in the eastern sky comes back to my mind. I guess that he was attacked on this hilltop, but with what result I cannot tell. He is here no longer. We must now look after ourselves and make our own way to Rivendell as best we can. Thank you for the follow. Uh, how far is Rivendell? Asked Mary, gazing around wearily. The world looked wild and wide from Weathertop. I don't know if the road has ever been measured in miles beyond the Forsaken Inn, a day's journey east of Bree, answered Strider. 
Some say it is so far, and some say otherwise. It is a strange road, and folk are glad to reach their journey's end, whether the time is long or short. But I know how long it would take me on my own feet, with fair weather and no ill fortune. Twelve days from here to the ford of Brunaheim. Brynen, where the road crosses the loud water that runs out of Rivendell. We have at least a fortnight's journey before us, for I do not think we shall be able to use the road. A fortnight? Asked, said Frodo. A lot may happen in that time. It may, said Strider. They stood for a while silent on the hilltop near its southern edge. In that lonely place, Frodo, for the first time, fully realized that his, hom his homelessness and danger. He wished bitterly that his fortune had left him in the quiet and beloved Shire. He stared down at the hateful road, leading back westward to his home. Suddenly he was aware that two black specks were moving slowly along it, going westward. And looking again, he saw that three others were creeping up to meet them. He gave a cry and clutched Strider's arm. Look, he said, pointing downwards. <clears throat> At once, Strider flung himself on the ground behind the ruined circle, pulling Frodo down beside him. Mary threw himself alongside. What is it? He whispered. I do not know, but I fear the worst, answered Strider. Slowly, they crawled up the ledge of, crawled up to the edge of the ring again and peered through a cleft between two jagged stones. The light was no longer bright, for the clear morning had faded, and the clouds creeping out of the east now overtaken the sun, had now overtaken the sun, and sun as it began to go down. They could all see the black specks, but neither Frodo nor Mary could make out their shapes for certain. Yet something told them that there, far below Far below were black riders assembling on the road beyond the foot of the hill. Yes, said Strider, whose keener sight left him in no doubt. The enemy is here. Hastily they crept away and slipped down to the north side of the hill to find their companions.